Hegel said, to him who looks on the world rationally, the world looks rationally back. More than half a century later, Nietzsche said, when you stare long into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. These paired Spiegeliron passages express in nomic aphorisms sentiments that mark the endpoint of a critical arc of 19th century philosophical thought. Hegel's sunny homily epitomizes the optimism of his version of the Enlightenment rationalism that flourished in the previous century. Nietzsche's darker remark foreshadows the pessimism of a distinctive kind of nihilism rooted in reductive naturalism, which the events of the following century would make both familiar and fitting. Each of these successive 19th century currents of thought, one looking back to what had already been understood and one pointing ahead to what had yet to be dealt with, comes with a rationalizing narrative of progress. The first of disenchantment by reason, the second of disillusionment with reason. It was always essential to the self-understanding of enlightenment that it see itself as the advent of something both genuinely new and essentially progressive. It defined itself by the contrast between the light of reason that it sought, developed, and celebrated, and the darkness from which enlightenment arose and by which it was still surrounded and would always be threatened. The shadows of superstition, prejudice, and dogmatism cast by arbitrary despotic power sedimented in the merely traditional institutions with which those habits of thought connived and in which they thrived. The fundamental conceptual innovation of the time was not the focus on reason by itself. Philosophy, whose avatar is Socrates, had perennially championed reason. Nor is it the mere association of reason with freedom. Know the truth and the truth shall set you free, the Christian tradition in the person of John had already taught. What is wholly new in the Enlightenment philosophy, its characteristic insight, is its identification of that transformative emancipatory power with reason in its critical function. The only authority it admits as legitimate and legitimating is the authority of the better reason. That peculiar normative force, compelling only to the rational, that had so fascinated and puzzled the Greeks. And the Enlightenment acknowledges no higher judge competent to assess the merits of competing reasons than the natural light which the capacities of each individual reasoning subject equip it. That's why Kant says, sapere aude, dare to understand. This is the motto of Enlightenment. In his essay, identifying Enlightenment as man's relief from his self-imposed tutelage. The advent of an age in which individuals accept no authority transcending their own capacity critically to assess reasons, is for Kant, speaking here for the whole enlightenment, nothing less than humanity's coming to maturity. This emancipation is to be affected by the wholesale replacement of the traditional model of authority, which understands it exclusively in terms of the obedience owed by a subordinate to a superior, by a model that understands authority exclusively in terms of the force of impersonal reasons, accessible by all. Reasons, for Kant, can accordingly be identified as freedom in the form of autonomy. The authority of the superior in power is abolished. Authority resides only in one's own acknowledgement of reasons. All, of, all the great philosophers in the period from Descartes to Kant were theorists of enlightenment. Hegel, though, is the first to take the advent of modernity, for him, simply the single most important thing that's ever happened in human history, as his explicit topic. And further, he's the first to appreciate it, not just as an intellectual phenomenon, namely enlightenment. He was the first to conceptualize the economic, political, and social transformations as all of a piece with the intellectual ones. For Hegel, reason shows itself as having the form of a vast meta-narrative rationally reconstructing the emergence of modernity in all of its multifarious aspects. That narrative is progressive and triumphalist. It's the emergence of reason as sovereign both in individual subjective self-consciousnesses and in the social institutions that they shape and that shape them. It's also, and essentially as Hegel says, the history of the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Here, two strands of the Enlightenment come together faith in the sovereignty of reason, and the narrative of the emerging self-conscious realization 
of that sovereignty, which is the emancipatory power of reason. Freedom takes concrete form only in the practical, including the institutional, appreciation of the rational nature of genuine authority, the idea that reasons alone are normatively authoritative. This is reason's disenchantment of the subordination model of authority in favor of the model of autonomy as consisting in acting for reasons. This intoxicating identification of freedom and the authority of critical reason is the beating heart of German idealism. In it, ideas that in retrospect could be seen to have been all along implicit in Enlightenment rationalism come to fully explicit theoretical self-consciousness. And it's in just such a context, Hegel thinks, that countercurrents of thought become visible, as also having been all along implicit in that same tradition. In this case, a crucial trajectory of 19th century thought expresses the revenge of Enlightenment naturalism on Enlightenment rationalism. The form that revenge takes is genealogy. Genealogies directly challenge the very idea of the normative force of the better reason, which lies at the core of the Enlightenment rationalist successor to the traditional subordination model of authority. The principal practitioners of the genre I'm calling genealogy were the great unmaskers of the 19th century, above all Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, and closer to our own time, we might add Foucault. What they unmasked were the pretensions of reason. Kant had rigorously enforced the distinction between reasons and causes, criticizing Locke for producing what he called a mere physiology of understanding rather than a proper epistemology by running together issues of justification and causation. We must separate, he insisted, the quid juris, the question of right, from the quid facti, the question of fact. The first is a matter of the evidence for our beliefs, the second of their matter of factual causal origins. When the great genealogists dug down in the areas of discourse they addressed, they found causes underlying the reasons. Their enterprise can be rendered in relatively moderate terms. What they diagnosed were systematic distortions in the structure of communication, as Habermas puts it. For Marx, the distorting causes were economic classes. For Nietzsche, they were expressions of the will to power. For Freud, they were such things as lingering echoes of the child's role in the family romance. On the moderate understanding of genealogy, those causal factors shape the reasoning of those subject to them, operating behind their backs, so that their own thoughts and actions cannot be transparent to them. This way of thinking, th thinking about things at least leaves open the possibility of emancipatory critical discourses, which would make explicit those distorting causal factors, so breaking the hold they have on reasoners and moving them towards the ideal of rational self-transparency. But I'm gonna be concerned here with a more radical challenge genealogy can be seen to make to the Enlightenment's idea of reason. For one can take it that what the genealogists dug down to is not just causes distorting our reasons, but causes masquerading as reasons. When what we fondly believe to be reasons are unmasked, all that remains is blind causal processes. These processes have taken on the guise of reasons, but in fact yield nothing more than rationalizations. Genealogy in its most radical form seeks to dispel the illusion of reason. Now, as I shall use the term, genealogical explanations, concern the relation, genealogical explanations concern the relations between the act or state of believing, on the one hand, and the content that's believed, on the other. A genealogy explains the advent of a belief, in the sense of a believing, an attitude, in terms of contingencies of its etiology, appealing exclusively to facts that are not evidence that do not provide reasons or justifications for the truth of what's believed. In this sense, when it occurs to the young person that he's a Baptist because his parents and everyone they know are Baptists, and that had he been born in a different community, he would with equal conviction have held Muslim or Buddhist beliefs, that's a genealogical realization. And as is evident already in this mundane example, the availability of a genealogical explanation for a constellation of beliefs 
can have the effect of undercutting its credentials as something to which one is rationally entitled. The genealogy asserts counterfactual or subjunctive conditionals linking the possession of certain beliefs, attitudes of believing, to contingent events whose occurrence does not provide evidence for the truth of what's believed. If the believer had not had a bourgeois upbringing, were not driven by ressentiment, or had not had that childhood trauma, she would not have had the beliefs about the justice of labor markets, Christian ethics, or conspiracy theories that she does. None of those events upon which the genealogist asserts the holding of the beliefs in question are counterfactually dependent, however, provide evidence for what's believed. For the particular vocabularies they address, all of Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud offer natural histories of the advent of beliefs, believings, couched in those vocabularies. Ones to which the rational credentials of the beliefs, what's believed, are simply irrelevant. Natural causal processes of belief formation are put in place of rational ones. To him who looks on the world reductively, the world looks reductively back. This movement of thought, too, comes with its native meta-narrative of progress in understanding. The earlier replacement of theological necessity with rational necessity as the fundamental explanatory category is disenchantment of the world by reason. The replacement of rational necessity with natural necessity is disillusionment with reason. From the genealogical point of view, the enlightenment apotheosis of reason just substituted one ultimately supernatural delusion for another. The enlightenment was right to be impressed by the rise of the new science, to see it as requiring a thoroughgoing transformation of our understanding of our relations to our world. But from the genealogical point of view, it was insufficiently radical. It naturalized and so disenchanted the world, but it didn't disenchant us. The Enlightenment conception of individual knowers and agents who brought about and were in turn transformed by the convulsions of modernity retain a spark of divinity in the form of the faculty of reason. The genealogical movement of thought teaches by contrast that the subjects and their relations to the objects they know about and act on, no less than those objects themselves, must be thoroughly naturalized. But then, what about the normative force of the better reason? Is it too just an illusion arising from the play of natural forces? Or can it somehow be understood in terms of them? Can we really understand the natural science that's the source of our genealogies, of our believings, itself entirely in naturalistic terms? Must we? In its most radical form, the genealogical thought is that if we can understand the etiology of our believings and our preferings, intendings, and so on, in terms of causes that do not provide reasons for them, then talk of reasons is shown to be out of place, not only superfluous, but actively misleading. This meta-narrative of genealogy, as unmasking illusions of reason, depends on the disjunction, causes or reasons, being exclusive. It's forcing a choice on us. Genealogy, in other words, turns Kant's distinction between causes and reasons back on itself. It becomes a snake that poisons itself by biting its own tail. Now, Marx and Freud offer local genealogies. That is, they offer genealogical analyses only of a specific range of discursive practices, the use of only some vocabularies, the vocabulary of political economy, or the vocabulary one uses to explicate and make intelligible one's psychological motivations. Though Nietzsche's most detailed stories are also of this local kind, he points the way to the possibility of a more global genealogical lesson, that a suitably thoroughgoing reductive naturalism might undercut the rational credentials, not just of some parochial region of our belief, but of the whole realm. The very idea of reason as efficacious in our lives would be called in question by globalizing the genealogical enterprise to extend it to all discourse. In this form, genealogy would be what Tennyson called the little rift within the lute that by and by shall make the music mute and ever widening slowly silence all. 